who begrudgingly emerged from his room, again wearing black jeans several sizes too large, and a metal spiked wristband. He set to eating his eggs without so much as a glance at anyone else. Hunter, how are things at the savvy agency these days? Her mother asked. Busy. We had a few projects shuffle, and I think we're just trying to keep up. Her father looked up from his plate. I read an article about the company online. A piece in Time Out? Hold the phone. Her father had not only spoken directly to her, but shown enough interest as to Google her company? Had hell frozen over and she missed the memo? She didn't know what his angle was, but she really didn't care. Yeah, we're doing well. But apparently he wasn't done. Do you foresee expansion into any kind of investor relations? What the hell do you care? Okay, it was harsh, but it was what came out. All eyes swiveled to her, including the four-year-olds. Hunter, Claire said quietly. Sorry, was that too candid? Her father looked mildly uncomfortable. It's okay. I was just curious about the business. But we can talk about something else. As the conversation picked up around them, it was clear that the others had shifted into overdrive to cover the less than successful exchange. Everyone was extra nice and polite, as if setting an example for what breakfast conversation should sound like. Hunter busied herself with her plate, feeling guilty for making the rest of the room uncomfortable. But not for how she'd addressed her father, the same man who told her she was an embarrassment when she'd taken her first girlfriend home. This, after not having acknowledged her existence for years prior. Her mother caught her eye as she ate and smiled. She had a way of doing that, centering Hunter when she needed it. And it helped to pull her back into the fold of things. She watched her brother for a moment. Plans today, Kevin? He looked up, seeming almost shocked to have been spoken to. Don't know. I was going to head to the air show on base later, her father said to him. You can go with me if you want. Kevin nodded at his food. Yeah, cool. What time? Couple of hours, her father said. Hunter, any interest? She felt like she'd stepped into the twilight zone. She made sure to answer with civility she didn't actually feel this time. No, I have a flight late this afternoon. I'll stay here with Mom, catch up. He nodded and went back to his food. Strangest visit home ever. Samantha shoveled through the puzzle pieces, looking for the one that showed three-fourths of the blue window awning. It was Sunday afternoon. Hunter had gotten in from Ohio late the night before, and this was the first chance they'd had to talk about her trip. So, do you think he was extending some sort of olive branch? Hunter handed her the piece she sought. That's the thing. I have no idea. For my father, any kind of interest in my life is uncharted territory. But at this point, it's unwelcome. Sam stopped her work on the puzzle and looked at Hunter. It was clear the trip had her in a weird place. Maybe don't be so quick to say that. Hunter balked. Really? You know what he's like. Sam shrugged. Yeah, but people change. Maybe he's trying. Hunter moved to the couch, clearly in contemplative mode. Claire said his health hasn't been so great. And he looked older. Much. So, maybe that's it. Maybe whatever is going on with him physically has him rethinking the way he's treated his kids all these years. I'm not saying that you should race into his proverbial open arms. But... Think about keeping your mind open for down the road. Hunter met her eyes. Not sure I can do that. But enough about him. 
She dropped her palms onto her knees with a slap. What have I missed? How have you been? What have you worn? Samantha smiled at the questions, genuinely happy to have Hunter home. She'd been surprised at just how much she'd missed her while she'd been gone. The apartment felt lonely, but not just for anyone. She abandoned the puzzle and came to sit on the arm of the couch. Well, Alvis and I entered into a bit of a crossword puzzle competition. He was woefully second place. But in better news, he won the sustained eye contact competition that followed hands down. Hunter leaned down and scratched Elvis under his chin. She's telling lies about you. We both know you rock at crosswords. Elvis whined quietly in response. He'd stuck close to Sam while Hunter was away, even slept next to her in bed. But it was obvious now, as he refused to leave Hunter's side, that he was thrilled she was home. Something they both agreed on. Hey, are we okay? Hunter asked. Sam understood the implication. Hunter was asking about Sexgate, which was essentially the last time they'd seen each other. She felt a little unsteady with their arrangement, especially since it was atypical behavior for her. She was a romantic, after all, and sleeping with someone for the sake of anything other than actual emotion was outside her experience level. But then again, she was feeling ready to venture away from her norm. And this felt like taking life by the horns for once. Plus, Hunter was her friend, and she felt safe with her. Yeah, I think we are. So, did you think about me while I was gone? Hunter teased. Dream about me. She raised an overly seductive eyebrow, which forced Samantha to throw a pillow at her, because she wasn't getting away with that. Just because I slept with you doesn't mean you can flirt with me. It doesn't? Nope. Against the friends with benefits rule. We're friends right now. This is the friend part of our relationship. Well, that seems wildly unfun. Sam pushed off the couch and went back to the puzzle. Deal with it. And get back over here and help with this puzzle. My cafe is gaining on your building. You gotta keep up, slacker. Hunter stood. You are really, really bossy. And you love it. Chapter 10 so, Howard, what brought you to New York? Sam sipped the champagne that Howard had insisted they order, enjoying the way the bubbles tickled her throat on the way down. Her spirits were high. It felt good being out on an actual date. Women, Howard said. She choked a little on the champagne at his response. I'm sorry, did you say women? Oh, yes he said in his cute little Howard voice, almost like a well-mannered cartoon character, sitting there with that red bow tie, the same one from his profile photo, and tan jacket. She wasn't judging him. It was a definite choice, that outfit, and he was owning it. I heard that the women in the Big Apple are the prettiest women just about anywhere. So I moved my software company from Iowa to find out for myself. He certainly had a slow delivery style. He certainly had a slow delivery style, as if each word carried special meaning for him. Oh, and how has that worked out? Well, have you looked in the mirror lately? He pulled his face back and shook his head. My, you're stunning, Samantha. I'm so glad you opened up your heart to the world of online dating. There's so much for people like us to explore. Thank you. Um, it's a little new for me. I will admit to being nervous. 
I've never been on a blind date, much less an online one. But do you want to explore? The waiter chose just that moment to deliver their meals, which brought her a moment to ponder how one should answer such a strange and vague question. Explore? Our love connection. Oh, I think it might be a little premature for the word love, don't you, Howard? Maybe we could just have this meal together and get to know one another a little. Well, that sounds just dandy. Everything you say is dandy. Wow, genuine enthusiasm. It was sweet. Not exactly sexy. At all. In any way, shape, or form. But he was an earnest little guy, and that counted for something, right? She had him pegged at about 5'3", with a slight comb-over. That part had not been well represented in his online photo. Do you enjoy NASCAR? He asked, taking the tiniest bite of steak ever assembled. Really, what was the point of a bite like that? She watched him chew the sliver daintily before reminding herself of the question. As in racing? No, I've never really been into NASCAR. That's okay. I'll teach you. The cars, they go in a whirly circle and try to catch one another. It's like tag for cars. It'll be so much fun when we watch at my place on Sundays. There would be no NASCAR watching. Silent sigh. And she didn't have the heart to point out that, in fact, NASCAR was nothing like tag. I'm more of a book and movie kind of girl myself. Do you read much? At this point, she was just trying to make conversation before exiting politely. Howard was not, as he would say, her love connection. I enjoy reading cookbooks. Oh, so you like to cook? At last, an overlap. They could compare notes, recipes, or discuss their enjoyment of creating a new dish. No, I just like to read them. Sam took a sec. Oh. Howard leaned forward, stealing a glance at a nearby table to make sure no one was listening. How am I doing? He whispered. What do you mean? She whispered back. My neighbor Sheila says I'm worthy of a restraining order. Is that a statement or a goal? I'll have to think on that. He sat back in his chair pensive, leaving Samantha more mystified than ever. She ate the remaining food on her plate, smiling politely at Howard, who continued to cut his food into infant-sized portions before delicately placing each bite in his mouth with practiced care. When would you like to get together again? Howard asked, taking out a pocket calendar. Sam took a deep breath. Here's the thing. I'm not thinking that's such a good idea. Is it? The love connection? She made a point to look sorrowful. It is, I'm afraid. The love connection is important, and if it's not there, you can't force it. You can't force it, exactly. Howard was gracious enough to pay the check and walked Samantha to the corner. You're just a wonderful big apple girl. I can tell. Thank you for having dinner with me at this fine bistro down the block from us now. Okay, he was back to being cute again. She wanted to straighten his tiny bow tie and pat his head. I'm happy to have met you, Howard. I wish you well. She placed a kiss on his cheek. I wish you well too, Samantha. In all of your life's pursuits. I hope you find your extra special love connection.
He placed something in her hand and walked away. She glanced down and found herself staring in mystification at a $100 bill. Howard, wait, no. But he closed the door to an idling cab and was gone. She looked down at the cash. Seriously? How'd your hot date go? Hunter asked from the couch when Samantha arrived home. She was tucked under a blanket with Elvis curled into the crook of her knee. Once he spotted Samantha, however, he jumped down from the couch and came to greet her, his entire body wagging like a tail. Hi, little Elle. She stooped down and scratched behind his ears, which seemed to make him smile his Elvis smile. She'd never met a dog who'd mastered the art of smiling the way he had. She straightened and stared at Hunter. I think I may be a prostitute. You should know this. A dinner prostitute, but still a prostitute. Hunter, who had the top of her hair pulled back in a clip today, studied her nonchalantly. A uh, dinner whore? Congratulations. I don't know many of those. You think I'm kidding, but I'm not. The guy literally handed me a hundred bucks on the street and then took off. She held up the hundred as evidence. Whoa. Well, you are an excellent dinner companion. She hung up her cardigan on the coat rack. Right. Maybe I should add it to my resume. Hunter smiled. Please list it as dinner whore. I'm in favor of the term. It's growing on me moment to moment. Sam batted Hunter's feet out of the way and sat at the end of the couch. You're on. DW for short and then she caught a detail she'd missed when she first arrived. Hunter eyed her. What? There's an actual book in your lap. Oh, my word. You're all cozy and reading. Hunter glanced down at the novel and shrugged. It happens on occasion. I thought I'd see what the fuss is about, and then there's the fact that I do whatever I can to hear you say Oh, my word. Say it again. Samantha ignored the jab and lifted the spine of the book as she dipped her head. Pride and Prejudice, one of my all-time favorites. I figured as much from the broken-in spine. I like this Elizabeth. She has a subtle humor about her, a cool chick. She makes jokes when she's nervous. You do that, too, by the way. Yeah, well, in a perfect world, I'd rather be like you, composed and unaffected in those sorts of moments. No way. That would be boring. The world needs a blushing Samantha Ennis who diverts with humor. She smiled at Hunter. I like that you're reading it. It will be fun to see the book through someone else's eyes, yours especially. I happen to value your thoughts a great deal. That sounds like pressure. I hope I don't disappoint you. Hunter met her gaze and held on. I'm sorry your night was cut short. I know you were hoping Howard J. would be the bow-tie-wearing man of your dreams. Let's sigh. I was hoping, but I'll live, Sam said. And never look at NASCAR the same way again, consequently. Or steak, for that matter. Care to explain? I'm not sure I could find the words. It's safe to say that Howard and I are not a match. And it's now occurring to me that finding my match, if he or she is even out there, is a more difficult task than I had originally hoped. Is it horrible that after everything, I still want that for myself? Some day down the road, I want the romance novel. Hunter studied her, the playful smile of earlier replaced with a sincere understanding. And you deserve it. Samantha adjusted her spot on the couch and brought her knees up to her chest. Several years back, I made this list of everything I wanted in the perfect person for me. Kind, funny, successful, good-looking, wants to have kids, gets my quirks, a killer chef, well-read. I mean... The list went on and on. 
She covered her face with her hand as embarrassment struck. I can't believe I just told you that. Miss Anti-Relationship, you must think I'm so naive and pathetic. I don't think that. I'm happy you told me about your list. There's nothing wrong with having one. Samantha dropped her gaze to the floor and examined the swirling patterns where the rug met the cement. I think I'd settle for kind at this point. Funny couldn't hurt. But the full package is unrealistic. That list needs shortening, and I think it's time I acknowledge that. Hunter stared at her, and it was one of those rare moments where Sam didn't know what she was thinking. It was a far away look that Hunter only got once in a while. Hunter, you in there? Hunter took a breath and smiled. Yeah, sorry, right here. She placed her hand on top of Hunter's and squeezed. Thanks. You've been a great friend to me through all of this. Libby, Howard, us. She left it there, knowing that Hunter would fill in the gap. As saying, the night I ripped your clothes off, felt somehow outside the mood. Hunter straightened. You're one of the most important people on the planet to me. You know that. The words prompted a warmth to move through Samantha and brought a smile to her face. I do, but it's nice to hear it. I can safely say the same right back to you. There was a silence between them now as the comments hovered and settled, but not the uncomfortable kind. That was the thing. As different as they were, things were always easy between them. Samantha cherished that. Finally, Hunter closed her book and turned to Sam. I don't know if you're home for the night or not, but Mallory and I were planning a jaunt to showplace in an hour. Brooklyn and Jess might join us later. It could cheer you up from your crash and burn date. A jaunt, huh? She said, swatting Hunter's knee. You're all Jane Austen over there. I love it. I may be a club kid, but I'm capable of high culture, Hunter said, looking adorably proud of herself. Samantha had to smile, despite the surge of something powerful that pulsed through her in response to the display. Friend or not, Hunter had a way of doing that to her, and it would probably take some getting used to. Surely any minute, her body would stop its thrumming. It seems you are. But it was only natural to see Hunter in a new light now, given recent events. Probably the perfect cure for it all was a night out with her friends. A little fun and distraction now that her social calendar was unexpectedly free. Samantha stood. I should probably go stare at my wardrobe in confusion before pulling something off the hanger randomly and putting it on. You come up with the best plans. Yeah, well, steak with Howard and show place on a Friday night seem to call for different costumes. Grey Gardens shout out. Samantha turned back. Whoa, how did you know that? Hunter shook her head and returned to her book. I know a lot more than you give me credit for. You consistently underestimate me, Samantha Ennis and I have lots more to surprise you with. Buckle up. Sam headed off to her room, all the while turning that last sentence over in her head. Because she was beginning to think Hunter was right. She did underestimate her. They'd known each other forever, yet there seemed to be a lot more to Hunter than she'd ever realized. And for whatever reason, that knowledge zapped her with a surge of extra energy an excitement that carried her right into her bedroom until a strange sight on the edge of her bed pulled her focus. She paused, studying the neat pile of envelopes. Hunter, she called out to the living room. Yep, the mail is on the end of my bed. I know, Hunter called back. It looks good there. It wanted to branch out. Sam nodded in amusement. 
she understood the message and mentally accepted the challenge. Hunter was ready for a throwaway kind of night, one of those times that blended with a hundred other times just like it. And the fact that Showplace was wall-to-wall people when she and Sam arrived was awesome for her plan. The more the merrier had always been Hunter's go-to philosophy. Well, that and a no-regrets kind of mantra. She'd stayed away from the party scene long enough, but her head was a mess, and she needed to remedy that. Showplace was located just down the block from the loft. The casual bar-turned-nightclub on the weekends had easily developed over time into the foursome's favorite hangout. Monday through Thursday, it was the perfect place to gather and kick back over drinks and some good conversation. But once Friday night hit, a DJ set up shop, and the space transformed. Hunter loved the dichotomy. While the place was out of the way enough that tourists weren't an issue, word of the bar's killer vibe had trickled out, and the crowds were slowly picking up. While not exactly a gay bar by definition, it was safe to say that Showplace fell more and more that direction as time went on. The high ceilings of the converted warehouse gave the room a spacious feel, even though the place wasn't that large. The minimalistic decor, coupled with the purple and blue light bulbs that hung from the rafters, provided an industrial vibe, reminiscent of the neighborhood, that Hunter found rather chill. The front portion of the room was comprised of a dozen or so tall bistro tables with leather-backed chairs, all surrounding a central metallic bar. She and Sam located Mallory easily enough at their standard table to the left of the bar, set back from the dance floor. Mallory sipped a martini, which she raised to them as they sat. I got started early, that kind of week, Samantha grimaced. You really have been pulling the crazy hours. Serenity? Mallory nodded. Those women are high maintenance, and they have a lot of opinions. About water? Sam asked. Mallory's eyes widened. How did you know? Been there. What else? Twelve potential new client meetings since Wednesday, and I took Brooklyn with me on five. She really knows how to pull them in with her description of her ideas. She just lights up. She's great at making her excitement contagious, Hunter added. It's the Brooklyn factor, hard to resist. She pointed at Samantha. Cucumber martini? Sam nodded and smiled. Yes, please. Hunter maneuvered her way to the bar but the journey there was delayed by quite a few necessary hellos to various friends and acquaintances. Hunter's here, a voice called. She nodded hello. Hey, Hunter, from another side of the room. She waved. Where have you been? A random girl in front of her asked. I've missed you. Just busy. You know how things can get. It seemed as soon as she finished one exchange, there was someone else waiting to steal a kiss on the cheek or make her promise to dance with them later. She pressed forward just as another hand landed on her back. Hunter Blair, also known as Missing in Action. Stephanie. They'd hooked up once last year. It might have been twice. She was a fun girl. Short cropped hair that she kept bleached blonde, and a few well-placed piercings, some less visible than others, if she remembered correctly. Hunter grinned. Not M.I.A. I've been around. You just haven't been looking hard enough. Good to see you, though. I dig the jacket. It was something to say. She tended to compliment women whenever she could, an automatic pilot thing. She enjoyed making other people feel good. Can I just say? Stephanie said, moving her hands from Hunter's elbows up her shoulders. That I have never seen you look more delectable. Delectable is quite a word, Steph. I know lots of big words, sweetie. I can say them for you later if you'd like. Wow, 
Now that's an offer. Let's just see how the night plays out. You never know. She continued on her path to the bar. She had no intention of starting anything with Stephanie, and she wondered why she'd engaged in the flirtatious exchange. Her conversation with Samantha a few days prior played back in her head. Because you never want to hurt anyone's feelings. You should be more upfront if you're not interested. It seemed that advice wasn't exactly easy to implement. She waited patiently at the bar, subtly moving her head in time with the music, until Hope, the bartender, caught her eye and smiled. Speaking of a lot of attention from girls, Hope always had her hands full with the groupies that flocked to showplace just to sit at the bar and stare awestruck at her all night. She'd started work at showplace about six months prior and was instantly the talk of the lesbian regulars. With medium-length blonde hair, generally pulled back when she was working, soft brown eyes and an easy smile, Hope garnered lots of attention. But she kept her head down, made the drinks, and collected her tips, preferring to stick to her job rather than chatting up girls. She and Hunter had struck up a friendship over the past few months, and they found that they had quite a few things in common. Hey, Hope said, resting her forearms on the bar in front of Hunter. How's your night? Just getting started, Hunter said, projecting her voice above the music. How's yours? Hope glanced around. It started picking up about eight and hasn't slowed down for a second. I'm going to sleep like a baby tonight. Won't make it home until probably three. But you've landed at least ten phone numbers already, if I had to guess. Hope grinned, dropped a cherry on top of a beverage, and handed it across the bar to a waiting woman. You know I don't pay attention to that kind of thing. I'm working. 650, she said to the girl before turning her attention back to Hunter. Hey, did you check out that band in the East Village? I wanted to hear what you thought before I ventured out. No, I skipped it. But if you decide to catch a set sometime, let me know. I'll tag along. You're on. Now, what can I get for you? I need a cucumber martini and a bourbon and coke. Coming up. When Hope returned with a tray with three drinks instead of two, Hunter raised a questioning eyebrow. Hope shrugged. Mallory's drink looks a little low. Hunter stared at Hope, enjoying this. But you don't pay attention to that kind of thing. You're working. Spotting a customer in need of a drink is part of that job. She winked at Hunter, and I'm excellent at my job. It wasn't the first time that Hope had sent Mallory a drink, and it probably wouldn't be the last. Well, thanks. She slid Hope some cash for hers and Sam's cocktails and made her way back to the table. A refresher for you, she said to Mallory, placing the drink in front of her. On the house. You're officially a stud, by the way. Mad props. Oh, no. This is from the bartender, isn't it? Mallory eyed the drink critically. I don't know how I feel about stud status. Hunter stared at her. Don't overthink it. Hard for you, I know. But you'll manage. Enjoy your drink and wave to hope. It's what you do. She shifted her focus and a cucumber martini for Sam. She placed the glass in front of Samantha. Thank you. Samantha smiled widely in appreciation, and Hunter couldn't seem to look away. She radiated tonight. She'd complained about her inability to put an outfit together, but there was something so simplistic about her look, a casual solid green sundress with a silver necklace that brought out her eyes and easily made her the most attractive woman in the room. Her hair was down, and she must not have blow-dried it that day, as it fell in subtle waves that clung just past her shoulders, shiny and soft, like some kind of shampoo commercial. Hunter remembered the way it had cascaded softly through her fingers when they'd kissed in the entryway of Samantha's room. 
how sweet it had smelled when she buried her face in it in Sam's bed. A tingle moved through her at the very vivid sensation. Hunter, she heard Brooklyn say, and then there was hands on her shoulders from behind. Hey, you in there? Yeah, totally, sorry. She turned and focused her attention on the newly arrived Brooklyn, breaking into a smile at the addition to their table. You guys made it. She'd seen Brooklyn earlier that day, but she pulled Jessica in for a quick hug. Thanks for the invite, Jessica said as Hunter released her. We had dinner at home first, but it's nice to get out. There might have also been a quickie, she heard Brooklyn whisper to Samantha as she assumed the seat next to her. Ah, yes, young love, what must that be like? She chose not to dwell, downing half of her drink instead. She had a lot of feelings swirling, and because she didn't quite know what the hell they were or meant, she opted instead for a bit of unbridled distraction. I need to dance, she said to everyone and to no one. Without waiting for a response, she made her way to the dance floor and let the music take her far from life's complications. The floor was crowded, but that almost made it easier to lose herself among the masses. The beat was fast, and she lifted her hands and tossed back her head. The prickle from the alcohol snuck into her system, loosening her limbs and dulling her senses just enough. A girl turned into her, and they danced together. She slid one of her arms around the girl's waist. She'd seen her before. They'd chatted over drinks some time back. They danced closer with each rhythmic pulse. Hypnotic, really, the sensation of pressing against a virtual stranger to a monotonous beat. Well, Hunter is in game mode tonight, Mallory said, smiling from their table, her eyes on the dance floor. But Samantha didn't need the update, she'd seen for herself. As Brooklyn recounted her most recent run-in with a traffic cop, Samantha perfected the art of divided attention. Though she threw in the occasional, no way, wow, or nice, in response to Brooklyn's story, her true focus remained about a hundred feet away, where Hunter danced in a rather sexy manner with some club kid who looked like she wanted to devour Hunter right then and there. It wasn't long before the random girl's arms moved up Hunter's body to around her neck, in a display so overt that Samantha rolled her eyes. What's with the face? You don't agree? Brooklyn asked. Busted. She had no idea what Brooklyn had just said, but she could totally play this off. No, you're right. Brooklyn seemed satisfied. I just think that as long as I'm not putting anyone in danger, what does it matter if I push the bounds of a yellow light? Brooklyn continued her story. But not far away, the brunette pressed her body to Hunter's, just as that Stephanie girl joined them on the dance floor. She watched as Hunter turned to Stephanie, and the two moved like they were born to dance with one another. Hunter tossed her hair. Stephanie smiled, entranced by the visual, and matched her step for step. For whatever reason, it angered Samantha. All of it. And the fact that she was angry just made her that much more angry, in some sort of exponential anger scenario that royally sucked. Because what did she have to be angry about, really? Those women were not good enough for Hunter, true. But if Hunter enjoyed that kind of thing, who was she to care? Just because she'd been with Hunter once did not give her the right to dictate who she danced with. And she was so not jealous right now, anyway. Because what the hell? She was not that girl. She just wasn't. The music was pounding way too loud. There were too many people. And if that Stephanie chick danced any closer to Hunter, they'd be the same person. Sam, did you hear me? Brooklyn asked. She turned to Brooklyn, the words flying out of her mouth before she had time to censor them. You want to know what I heard? 
You're a menace behind the wheel of a car. You always have been. But you know what? I think you kind of like it. And that's what I heard. While Brooklyn's mouth formed a tiny O, Mallory studied Sam with concerned interest, always the voice of reason. Sam, everything all right with you tonight? Me? Fine. Never been better. Why do you ask? She had no idea why she was yelling, but she had no ability not to. Brooklyn raised her hand as if called on in class. Because your eyes are flashing scary? And then there is the fact that your eyebrows are kind of drawn down into a hostile little line, Mallory added, moving her hand in a circle. Samantha balked. I do not have hostile eyebrows. They're a tad hostile, Jessica said calmly, not to interrupt the banter. Hey, you guys, a random girl said, leaning on their table. She was maybe 22 at most and a little too perky for Sam's liking. Don't mean to bother you, but is Hunter here tonight? One of my friends was just curious. Brooklyn opened her mouth to speak, but Sam was on it. She's right over there. Tell your friend the line starts to the left. There'll be a survey after. Once the girl moved on, Brooklyn slid Sam's martini a little closer to her. Have a drink, Sammy. You know what? Best idea of the night. She picked up the martini and downed the sucker. But she knew where there were more and headed off on a mission to locate one. When the music changed, Hunter was ready for a break. The dance floor was hot, both literally and figuratively, and she needed a moment to catch her breath. She spotted Samantha at the bar, and though she was technically the reason Hunter had attempted to distract herself, she just couldn't seem to stay away. A glutton for punishment, clearly. Hey, she said, sliding in next to Sam. Number two for you already. You're cutting loose tonight. Something like that, Sam murmured without giving Hunter so much as a sideways glance. Hunter nodded her head in time to the music. This place is crazy tonight. More people than usual. I think our secret is out. Seems like it. Still no eye contact. And either Sam was participating in a scarcity of words contest, or she didn't want to talk to Hunter. What's going on? She asked. Nothing. Another short answer. Okay. So did this mean they were in some sort of argument she hadn't been informed of? Hey, why aren't you looking at me? Samantha turned fully then, and Hunter had the answer to her question, as Sam looked anything but friendly. Better? She asked coolly, as her eyes settled on Hunter's. Hope presented Samantha with her drink, and a moment later she was gone, leaving Hunter standing there, wondering what the hell she had done to deserve that arctic blast. When she arrived back at the table, there was yet another new arrival. Jessica's right-hand man, Bentley, stood next to Brooklyn. She'd only spent a limited amount of time with the guy, but they'd quickly bonded. He was laid back and fun, someone she could mess with at will. Him being a bit of a ladies' man himself, they seemed to recognize the common ground in each other. Jessica looked between them. Hunter, you remember Bentley, yes? Of course. Hey there, Bent. Your Mets are looking like a band of sixth graders lately. He grinned and raced around the table, wrapping his giant arms around her in a playful chokehold from behind. My favorite rascal is here, he said, kissing the side of her head several times. And my Mets will run your Reds all over the field. He released her and she stumbled forward before reversing direction and punching him in the arm hard for the physical harassment. She got him good, too, the wily bastard. Ow, stop beating me up. I'm fragile, he said. Please. As for my reds, I guess we'll just have to wait and see, she said, dusting her hands together. The fast-paced music shifted behind them to a slower, more melodic tone. 
to keep the scene vibrant, they didn't play a lot of slow songs at Showplace on weekends, with the exception of one or two well-placed crowd favorites throughout the night. If she had a crystal ball, she'd expect Stephanie to approach her any moment. But she had other ideas. She met Sam's eyes across the table and inclined her head subtly in the direction of the dance floor. She wanted to fix whatever was off, and she wanted to do it now. Holding Samantha as they moved slowly to the music was just an extra added benefit that she didn't allow herself to dwell on. But Samantha's gaze glided to Bentley, who shrugged at Hunter. She promised her first dance to me. He offered Samantha his hand, and she accepted. Hunter watched them take their place among the dozen other swaying couples. But it was the moment when Samantha looked up at Bentley and smiled that Hunter felt her stomach clench in the most uncomfortable manner. You okay? Jessica asked, placing a hand on Hunter's thigh. You aren't looking so good. Maybe drink some water, Mallory offered, mistaking her demeanor for too much drink. But that was good. Let them think that. Because if the world knew how she was really feeling, like she didn't even recognize herself, well, things would certainly get a lot more complicated. Hunter was feeling something she didn't understand, that she couldn't quite name, and it was freaking her the hell out. She'd been lusting after Samantha for weeks. But was this more than just lust? And as if in reflex, she panicked. Because that's not how she operated. I have to go, she announced to the table. Brooklyn and Jessica exchanged glances. I'll walk halfway with you, Brooklyn said, pushing back from the table. Make sure you're all right. Hunter didn't so much as pause. Do what you want, but I'm fine. Just before pushing the door open, she stole one last look at the dance floor. At Samantha swaying sweetly with Bentley, smiling up at him. Jealousy was unattractive, a trait she'd always prided herself on never having to deal with. She was the exception to most any rule, damn it. Not anymore, apparently because the healthy dose of envy she'd just been doused with served as a sobering reminder that maybe she'd given herself too much credit. New verdict? Jealousy sucked. You want to talk about it? Brooklyn asked as they walked the darkened street, dodging passers-by. Hunter folded her arms across her body, partly to brace against the chill and partly in self-protection mode. She wasn't in a good place. Not really. This isn't you drinking too much. I've met Drunk Hunter many times, and she's a happy drunk. Something else is going on with you, and it has been for a while now. And then Brooklyn stopped dead in her tracks, forcing Hunter to pause and look back at her. What? Are you coming or not? Brooklyn's mouth fell open. You've? Totally fallen for her, haven't you? Hunter felt the blood drain from her face, and she grappled for the words that would best explain what she couldn't even explain to herself. She wasn't falling for Sam. She didn't do love. But there was a depth of emotion there that she couldn't quite pinpoint. How could she explain to Brooklyn that there was something pure and wonderful about Samantha, unlike any other girl? That she was kind and funny and quirky and so beyond beautiful it wasn't fair? That when she stared up at Hunter with those fathomless green eyes, Hunter ran out of air? But instead of sharing those things, all she could manage to say was, No, that'd be crazy. But you have feelings for her, Brooklyn countered. Hunter dropped her head back and looked up at the sky. I don't know, maybe a little. The corners of Brooklyn's mouth turned up in happy excitement as she skipped the rest of the distance between them. Was Brooklyn happy about this? Because honestly, Hunter wasn't sure she would be.
It complicated so much. Brooklyn snatched up Hunter's hand and squeezed it against hers. So, are you guys going to live together and get married and have little yoga babies? Family tree poses for the win? She blinked at Brooklyn, trying to decode the sentence before understanding zapped her. She told Brooklyn about April in the park, and the misinformation had carried through to this very moment. Damn it. As she stood there on the corner of Spring and Broadway, she recognized that the crossroads in front of her literally mirrored the decision she faced about what to tell Brooklyn. But why ruin the chemistry of the group for something that wasn't going to go anywhere anyway? That couldn't go anywhere. She and Sam were hookup buddies, that was it. The people Samantha dated were nothing like Hunter. So what would be the point in confessing her feelings to Brooklyn? Just because it would help to talk out her situation with someone? Not a good enough reason. Hunter took a cleansing breath. Yoga babies might be a little far off. She swallowed the truth and felt heavier for it. Brooklyn pulled her into a hug and held on. I just know you are probably freaking out over this. I did the exact same thing. Just don't run from your feelings. Promise me? Give them a chance. I promise. Hunter returned the hug, knowing that was an agreement she wouldn't be able to keep. Sam was feeling a little bit tipsy when she and Mallory walked home from Showplace that night. The sky was clear, and there was a night chill that had Samantha wishing she'd brought a sweater. It was just after midnight, and despite her best efforts to turn the evening around, the images of Hunter dancing with that Stephanie girl hung on like the plague, making everything that followed taste bitter and unhappy. Mallory nudged Sam's shoulder with her own as they walked. Something's going on in that analytical brain of yours. She fired a glance at Mallory as they split the sidewalk to leave room for a gaggle of teenagers to pass. What makes you say that? You're uptight, argumentative, and quiet. Which is the way you get when column A doesn't match column B. I'm expecting you to go home and put on your glasses and serious ponytail while you work out the life details. The serious ponytail definitely helps me focus. It might be coming out later. The glasses are just for, you know, vision. Mallory chuckled quietly. Okay. So what gives? Is it Bentley? You two looked really good together out there. I counted three dances. Are you interested? Not really. Samantha offered a small smile at the memory. He gave me his number, though. He wants a proper date. And I have to admit, it was nice to be noticed that way. You know, really noticed? Why do you say it like that? You're a very noticeable girl, Samantha. You don't give yourself enough credit, and I think you should call him. Bentley, I mean. Don't let the whole Libby scenario take you down. You're a romantic, and I've always loved that about you. Thanks. Sam nodded, considering Mallory's words. I'll think about it. But Sam knew she wouldn't be calling Bentley. There hadn't been that draw she felt with Libby, or the spark she felt with... Nope. Not going there. But my advice is don't stress about it. Start off casual. Low pressure. You're just coming off a big heartbreak, and you need to allow room for yourself to live a little, to... I slept with Hunter. Holy Hillary Clinton. Had she just said that? She hadn't intended to confess to Mallory, but the words apparently had a mind of their own. Mallory stopped in her tracks on the sidewalk and tilted her head to the side in confusion before giving her head a little shake and smiling. I'm sorry. I think I hallucinated for a second. It happens. I'm not even going to repeat what I thought you said. Could you run that by me again? There was no turning back now, and the rogue words tumbled out of her mouth without preamble. She blamed the alcohol. Or... Maybe just her stupid subconscious. 
I slept with Hunter. I did. We had sex. And it was good. Astronomically good. Mallory didn't say anything. Her lips parted slightly. But that was the only indication that she'd taken in any sort of information. Mallory, talk back now. Your turn. She shook her head slowly. Can't. Still processing. Samantha shook Mallory's arm a bit. It's not the end of the world, right? I mean, friends sleep together sometimes, right? I mean, right? You and Hunter were together. Yes. On purpose. Sam stared at her. Well, we didn't just accidentally bump into each other, if that's what you're asking. Oh, God. I know. I've been oh godding too. Take a minute and do some. I'm trying to be mature about this and move on from the godding, so I'm not gonna join in. It's kind of my lot in life, maturity, and yours too, by the way. So, where are the mature words of wisdom, Mal? Because I'm counting on them. This is bad. Mallory took a deep breath. We should sit, because I don't know what else to do with myself. Samantha scanned the street, craning her neck around the random guy dressed as the Green Lantern. She shook her head. This city on Friday night. There's a bench outside the coffee shop a block up. Do you want some coffee? If it comes with a bench, I do. The bench is part of the agreement. Mallory took a deep breath. Great. Take me to it. Ten short minutes later, and Samantha presented Mallory with a hot cup of coffee and held on to one for herself. She blew into the cup, watching as the steam rose and disappeared into the air around them. She took comfort in the cozy visual and warmed her hands on the toasty cardboard. Finally, she stole a look at Mallory. Listen, I'm sorry I sprang that on you back there. The thing is... You've always been someone that I admire, Mal, who has a head on her shoulders. I guess I really needed your input on this, whether I knew it or not. Is it serious between you? Sam shook her head. Psht, no. I was attracted to her. That part is true. Hell, everyone is attracted to her. Mallory turned on the bench to face Sam. But you're not everyone. You don't just jump into bed with people because you think they're hot. So it makes me wonder if there's something more to this. This was a valid point. Well, she's my friend, too. And I care about her a lot. And maybe I'm a little bit in rebound mode. And she was there for me. Oh, I bet she was. And then a thought seemed to occur to Mallory and she straightened. Was that your issue tonight? It was, wasn't it? It wasn't Bentley that had you all worked up. It was Hunter. Samantha covered her face with her hands. I don't know what happened there. She was dancing with those girls, but she always dances with those girls. Yet somehow, you were jealous, Mallory supplied. Because there's this whole new dynamic between you now. You can't just sleep with someone in a vacuum, Sam. There are repercussions in life. There doesn't have to be with this. Mallory held up a finger. Unless you actually have real feelings for her. Samantha sent her the same look she would have if she'd just announced Apple was selling at $4 a share. Because it was so not the case. No, Mal, you're not listening. It's lust. I'm lusting after one of my best friends on the planet, and I should probably find a way to stop doing that. I need therapy. Mallory stared at the sky. And now I do too. This is big. Do you know how big this is? Sam held up a hand. You're kind of shouting. And yes, I know how big this is. Mallory set her coffee cup down next to her. Well... I'd be lying if I said it doesn't freak me the hell out in regard to Savvy. The four of us have this perfect little balance in place. I don't want to upset that and see it all 
fall apart because you two can't keep your libidos in check. It's too important, Sam. I won't let it come to that. It will not upset the balance. I'll make sure of it. You have to make sure this never happens again. It's too important. Samantha took in the words. Mallory was right. It wasn't fair to just consider her and Hunter's take on the situation. Savvy had to come first. It won't happen again. Good. The two of you are going to be alone in the office a lot this week. You're going to be able to handle this? Of course. Who do you think I am? I'm not sure I know right now. When Sam arrived home that night, Hunter was once again on the couch reading her book. She knew Hunter had left Showplace ahead of her, but she'd been fairly confident that she'd headed off to a second location. She'd been in party mode, and that usually in Sam's experience meant late nights. What are you doing here? Hunter looked up from her spot on the couch. She was wearing black cotton short shorts and a red tank top. The fact that there was so much skin on display just served to annoy Samantha that much further. Because seriously, she was over all the Hunter thoughts and anything that prompted them. Done. Hunter shrugged and returned her attention to the book. I live here. The apartment was chilly, both literally and figuratively. And as Sam was already cold from the night air, she moved to adjust the thermostat. I just figured you'd be out with one of your many groupies. You know, bumping and grinding until the wee hours of the morning at some new club. As you can see, you were wrong. Hunter glanced up this time, but it was barely a flick. For whatever reason, the lack of engagement was beyond frustrating and only propelled Samantha further. You know, we probably need a system for when you bring one of them back here. Some way that I know to stay clear of your room. Because Jesus, can you imagine? A scarf on your door would work. It's ridiculously cliched, but probably necessary now that we live together. Yeah, I'm not into systems. Samantha shrugged in a patronizing manner as she faced Hunter, her annoyance at the situation flaring. What's it like to just pick one out at the end of the night? Is there any sort of criteria or just eeny, meeny, miny, mo when the clubs close? Her tone wasn't the nicest. In fact, she did nothing to hide her judgment. Her anger had spread out and sprouted wings, and there was apparently no holding it back. Are you kidding me with this? Hunter stared at her, eyes blazing. Oh, she had her attention now. I've lived here for over a month. Have I once brought a girl home with me? I don't monitor your every movement. Are you sure about that? She glanced at the thermostat on the wall. And did you just make it warmer in here? I'm tired of being hot at night. Can you turn it back? My bad, Samantha said, returning to the thermostat. I forgot how hot you were, and how important it is that you're treated as such. I mean, right? That's what's important to you. Hunter closed the book and leaned forward. What is your deal right now? Something you want to discuss, Sam? Or are you just trying a new personality? Quite frankly, I'm not a fan. No, I'm good. She headed for her bedroom as if it were the most casual thing in the world. Outside, a siren blared past the building, and inside felt just as chaotic. Everything in Sam's world was off, askew. She hated it. Yeah, you looked like it by the end of the night. Glad it's all working out for you. She turned back. Meaning? Hunter lifted a shoulder. You looked pretty content with Bentley is all. Maybe he does it for you more than any of the women I danced with ever could. Sam took a minute with the comment, and to be sure she understood its implication. The end result stung. Yes, I did enjoy dancing with Bentley, and that's all it was, a dance. But the fact that you just made some sort of veiled dig at my sexuality is not only juvenile, but offensive as hell. Hunter closed her eyes in disappointment at herself. 
Samantha was right. What she'd just said was horrible. It was one of those fights that took over until it felt like the fight was having you. Sam, wait. No. Sam shook her head. Please don't assume you know anything about what it's like to be me. To feel slighted on a daily basis by either the straight or gay community, depending on the day. So no, I'm not going to wait. I'm ready for tonight to be over. Enjoy your book. Hunter sat there on the couch, stunned, as the door slammed shut. She had no idea what had just happened, how their interaction had spiraled so far out of control. The comment she'd made was totally out of bounds, and the recriminations were already swirling to the point that she felt sick to her stomach. She'd acted out, attempting to strike back at someone she cared about because she was jealous. When in fact, it wasn't even representative of how she felt about Samantha's sexuality at all. It was the low-hanging fruit, and she was embarrassed that she'd gone there. The night's events and her own realizations had her already in a bad place and Samantha's antagonistic comments had just piled on to the point that she was feeling aggressive and a little out of control. And did Samantha really think she slept around? She was a flirt, that much was true. Who wasn't opposed to after-hours activity here and there, when it seemed appropriate? She was still in her twenties and wanted to enjoy them, but she had standards. She reached for Elvis and stroked his head, but the rest of her felt numb. She hated the way she looked through Samantha's eyes. Wild, careless, unworthy, and it resonated. Chapter 11 Thank you so much for agreeing to have lunch with me, Tanya said, sipping from her water glass. It was Tuesday afternoon, and though Sam had come up with every excuse to not have lunch with this woman, her hand was forced when Tanya finally copied Mallory on the request for a budget consultation. Shrewd. Very shrewd. Tanya had selected a rather upscale restaurant on the Upper West Side, the kind of place with white tablecloths, multiple forks, and women eating from large bowls of lettuce alongside Chardonnay. No problem, Sam said. You mentioned the budget, so I have brought with me some of the details we initially decided upon. She reached for her leather-bound portfolio until Tanya placed her hand on her wrist, stopping her progress. Can we get to that later, perhaps? Oh, sure. You'd rather eat first? If that's okay. I thought we could talk a little. Right on cue, the rather pretentious-looking waiter stopped by to take their order. While Samantha was dying for a cheeseburger, she followed Tanya's lead and ordered the spinach salad, dressing on the side. Yay! So, how have you been? Tanya asked, eyes wide, enthusiasm oozing from every perfect pour. I've been fine. How about you? Not so great, actually, she said, her voice cracking. Oh, and there were tears. Not tears, please. Lunch sans tears was what she had signed up for. Obligatorily, she followed up. Tanya, are you okay? Why are you crying? It's Libby, she practically sobbed. She's not happy, I can tell. She thinks I'm flighty, or too new age, or whatever. No, really? Shock, disbelief. Was it bad that she wasn't completely torn up about this? Because she actually full-on agreed with Libby. But what really came out of Sam's mouth was, I'm so sorry. Thanks, Sam. I invited you here, because I was hoping you had some girl-to-girl -girl advice. Oh, no. This wasn't happening to her. Wasn't there some sort of get-out-of-jail-free card for comforting your ex-girlfriend's new love interest? Surely she should be spared under some kind of fine print. I 
don't know that I'm the one to come to for words of wisdom when it comes to Libby. You know how things ended for us. But she just thinks so highly of you, Sam. It's always... Samantha says you have to find a goal for yourself and stick to it. Samantha is so level-headed and has a handle on life. Sometimes I think she wishes I were more like you. Interesting tidbit that she had to admit she enjoyed a little. I'm sure that's not true. You guys are just figuring each other out, probably. Do you want to look at the budget? But it was as if Tanya hadn't heard her. We are figuring each other out. And don't get me wrong, the sex is amazing. Mind-blowing, even. That part we've got down. Okay, low blow. Sam glanced around in desperation. Maybe she should order one of those salad chardonnays. But I feel this distance growing between us outside the bedroom. And I don't know what to do. I want to be her spirit animal, the lime to her water. But I'm failing. Samantha sighed, hating the fruit-water analogy and wishing she wasn't having this conversation. She closed her eyes and forced herself to answer. Have you tried to talk to her about it? No, I'm terrified of what she'll say. What if I'm right and she thinks we're a mistake? What if it's really you who she wants? Okay, that was interesting information. Was it possible Libby saw things differently now? Samantha wasn't sure how she felt about that, but she filed it away for examination later. As much as you may not want to, Tanya, I think communication is the way to go on this one. Avoiding the topic doesn't make it any less real. And you might be surprised. This whole thing could potentially be all in your head. Tanya seemed to like this and sat a little taller in her chair as the salads, dressing on the side, were delivered. You really are smart, Sam. I'm glad I called you. I'll talk to her tonight. That's me, Samantha said, turning to her salad. Good old dependable Sam. Should I talk to her before sex or after? Ah! Uh... I'll let you decide. Tanya leaned forward, full of new, scary energy. And now that I have you here, let's talk about chasing down that glow. I have a lot of ideas. Fabulous, she enthused dryly, understanding now that the budget had nothing whatsoever to do with the meeting. Samantha checked her watch and did a mad salad-to-exit calculation. It was time to get the hell back to Soho, because life was simply too short to spend on salad time with Tanya. But an hour later, as she stood on the crowded F train on her way back to work, her mind was still very much on the lunch from hell. What if what Tanya said was true? What if Libby did miss her? She might have a second shot. She hesitated at the prospect. There was a lot of water under that bridge. But then again, this was Libby she was talking about. Libby, who ticked all the boxes. As she walked the short distance from the train to the loft, there was an extra spring in her step and a slight smile on her face. Life was full of endless possibilities. Hunter stared at the blonde woman wrapped in a towel, her head tossed back in surrender as she enjoyed a luxurious mineral bath. Damn, she was tired of looking at this woman, and she ran her mouse across the model's face several times in angry protest. She'd been working on the print ad for Serenity for hours, but kept hitting the proverbial creative wall at every step. The image of the woman Serenity had supplied them with mocked her with all the relaxation and beauty and stupid luxurious blonde hair piled on top of her head. Unable to stand the frustration a minute more, she shut her laptop with a noticeable thud. Across the savvy loft, Samantha jumped at the sound, turned, and regarded her calmly. Problem, Hunter? They were alone in the office. And outside of the occasional polite work exchange, 
or apartment pleasantry. They hadn't fully engaged in any meaningful conversation since the war that was Friday night. To say things felt awkward was an understatement. But with Brooklyn and Mallory out on a client meeting, she and Sam were left to hold down the fort. It wasn't all that unusual, as both of their jobs were mainly office-based, though they were on their own more often now with the loss of the foster account. Hunter pushed up from her desk and moved to the really uncomfortable couch that Mallory insisted looked awesome in the space. Hunter had a love-hate with this couch. It did look great. That part was true. It also was hella hard to sit on. The serenity ad. I can't get it right, and I'm sick of the stupid model mocking me. Samantha took off the serious numbers glasses and rubbed her temple. I'm sorry, the ad mocks you? The woman in it does, yeah. She knows I'm struggling to get the opacity on the top layer perfect, and when I can't, she just looks all peaceful to contrast how angry I feel. It's her game. She's mocking me, and I'm breaking up with her. Hmm. I had no idea stills of models could be so judgmental. Can I see? The ad? Hunter sighed, trudged over to her laptop, and joined Samantha at her desk. Take a look. It's my best work ever in life, she said blandly, resting her chin in her hand in defeat. Samantha studied the layout briefly before taking an air. No way. You're that impressed? Samantha pointed at the screen and stared at Hunter, eyes wide. She's everywhere. It's Tanya. Tanya. And that would be? Love of Libby's life, ruiner of happiness, crazy representative of water and all things from the earth. Sam sighed and sat back in her chair. No wonder she was mocking you. You're lucky she doesn't reach through that screen and devastate everything that makes you happy, because that would be a typical Tanya move. And then she threw her head into her hands and downshifted. That was mean. Tanya's never been anything but nice to me. Creepy spa nice and annoying as hell, but still nice. I'm a mean person. She lifted her head. I didn't used to be, but I am now. I don't know why you talk to me. She dropped her head on the desk with a bang. Hunter took in the dramatic display with a quiet smile and placed a hand on Sam's back. Hey, accountant person, you're not mean. You're one of the nicest people I know. There is actually no better person than you. So, knock it off. Really? Sam squeaked from the doldrums of the desk. She lifted her head again, and the bright green eyes sparkled at Hunter. Because you didn't think so on Friday night and we haven't really spoken more than a handful of words since. Hunter shrugged a shoulder. I know. I was in a bad place on Friday and acted like an asshole. The thing that I said, I didn't mean. And you should know that if I could take it back, that whole interaction, I would. Me too. That was a horrible fight, and I take a lot of responsibility. Hunter appreciated that. But I took it where it didn't need to go, and I would like to apologize. No, I'm sorry. I was so out of line it was crazy. I don't want to fight with you. I happen to like you. A lot. Hunter reclined in her chair and grinned. Oh, yeah? What about me? Samantha blew out a breath, but she was smiling, and that was everything. Because Hunter had missed that smile. It had a way of turning around her entire day. We're really doing this? Oh, I think we have to. But then, Sam did something Hunter wasn't expecting. She took her hand, prompting the smile to fall from Hunter's face as the moment shifted into something new, uncharted. You, Hunter Blair, are valuable to me. You are talented and beautiful, but more than that, you're thoughtful. You look out for me. 
And when I'm around you, I feel challenged in the most unexpected of ways. They hit her hard, those words. Coming from Samantha, they carried a lot of weight. She and Samantha were staring at each other now, and Samantha's gaze dropped to her mouth. And God, that move affected Hunter. She had never wanted to kiss someone so badly in her life, and the knowledge that Sam was struggling too only doubled her desire. The air was thick around them, and the sound seemed to fade from the room. Whatever was bubbling between them seemed to gain momentum by the hour, and the fight only seemed to have tossed gasoline on the fire. There was now a hunger in Sam's eyes that had Hunter captivated and aching to touch her, intimately. She reached out and cradled Samantha's cheek, her skin soft and warm to the touch. At the contact, Samantha took a quick breath and hesitated a beat before backing out of the touch altogether. We should probably eat something, she said quietly. But her eyes hadn't once departed from Hunter's lips. I'll pick us up something from, um, Lulu's. She blinked purposefully, grabbed some cash from her purse and was gone, just like that. Alone in the office, Hunter knew they were in sync, maybe more than they had ever been. The question was whether to do anything further about it. She stared in frustration at the ceiling, wondering what she'd done to deserve this level of temptation surrounding the one girl she couldn't have. Damn the universe and all of its complexities. She opened the laptop and stared at the model. What? She asked the screen and shook her head. Spa bitches. Twenty-five minutes later, Samantha made her way up the sidewalk, carrying a bag with their usual lunch fare. A turkey club for her and pastrami on rye for Hunter. Homemade chips and two pickles on the side. Luckily, her heart rate seemed to have returned to normal from the unexpected exchange at the office. She wasn't sure how they'd gotten to snap, crackle, pop status so quickly, but they had. One minute they'd been talking about Tanya, and two seconds later, the temperature in the room had risen 20 degrees, and Samantha was having all sorts of intense cravings. She stole a chip from the bag as she turned the corner into the lobby of their building. There was purpose in her stride, as the world that had felt so wildly backward since her fight with Hunter was on its way to righting itself. Sure, there were still problems, she was already contemplating strategies to best keep herself from imagining Hunter naked for the rest of the afternoon. But anything was better than not talking, even... Good God, what was that? Something small and furry interrupted her train of thought and darted across the lobby, prompting Samantha to freeze and crush the bag of food against her chest in defense. Moving like an NFL ball carrier in overtime, she hightailed it back to the street to spare her life and assess the situation. Tiny rodent monster in the lobby. Tiny rodent monster in the lobby. It was the only sentence that would come. She didn't do rodents. Ever. In fact, they were high on the list of greatest fears. And this one had a long tail, which made her cringe all over at just the idea. After several cleansing breaths, Sam gathered enough courage to peer into the small lobby through the glass for any sign of Sly, their doorman. Sly would know what to do about the tiny rodent monster. He knew what to do about everything. But damn it all, there was no sign of Sly anywhere. Probably on his lunch break, which didn't seem fair. Doorman didn't need lunch when there were battles to fight. She took another look through the glass to pinpoint the TRM's location. Gasp. But in even more frightening news, it was missing. It could be anywhere, she shouted to the street, prompting a glance or two from passing pedestrians. Okay, so what am I supposed to do here? She studied the elevator, probably ten steps away once she entered the building. 
but there was always the risk that the elevator wouldn't arrive right off and she'd be stuck with the tiny rodent monster in a small space. What if it got near her? What then? But she didn't have a lot of choice. There was lunch and work and life to attend to, and she couldn't let a little rodent monster crisis get in the way of that. She rolled her shoulders. She could be a badass against a little mouse. Hell, she rode the subway. She sagged in defeat at a new realization. This was New York City. Who was she kidding? TRM was likely a rat, and that meant she would die if there were contact. Not of disease, but of abject horror. And that was all people would talk about. Samantha Ennis died via rat horror. She shook herself out of the Everill spiraling what-if scenario. Any more thought on the topic would be detrimental to the goal. So, she cleared her mind, threw open the door, and scurried the ten paces to the elevator bay. Mashing the up button 18,000 times in succession didn't seem to produce the elevator nearly as fast as she'd hoped. This was bad. Come on, come on, come on. And right on cue, there was the theme music from Halloween playing in her head. Excellent. Through it all, her eyes flew from one corner of the lobby to the other for any sort of furry movement. When she saw none, she shifted her focus briefly to the number readout above the bay and watched as the elevator descended from eight, seven, six, five. But then, out of the corner of her eye, was the slightest bit of rodent monster movement and, oh, Warren Buffett, it was against the wall and sniffing its way in her direction. Was it a mouse or a rat? She didn't know, but it had tiny little claws that made very faint clicking noises on the tile, a sound that would surely haunt her dreams for life. She tried to move, but her body was in charge and clearly on some sort of lunch break, probably with Sly. With every ounce of strength she had, she managed to run. It's possible she also screamed and tossed lunch in the air over her shoulder. She only knew that part in retrospect, ascertained from the safety of the sidewalk. Finally, in desperation and fear for her life, she pulled her phone out of her back pocket and called Hunter upstairs. She answered on the second ring. Did you get lost? Something horrible has happened. Hunter's voice switched quickly to concern. Okay, what's wrong? Where are you? Outside the building. There's a giant rat, a rodent monster in the lobby. I'm not making this up. It won't let me get to the elevator. It hates me. I hate it back. A pause. A uh, rodent monster? I think you're focusing on the wrong thing here. What do you mean it won't let you? Sam paused and leveled with Hunter. I can't walk past it, Hunter. I just can't. Do you think you could? On my way. She'd meant it, too. As three short minutes later, the elevator doors opened, and Hunter strode into the lobby, cool as a cucumber, wearing her baby blue camo pants and her black v-neck. Hunter excelled at filling out that neckline. She tossed a glance at the monster, which appeared very interested in their discarded lunch, smiled to herself, and made her way outside. That's your rodent monster? Sam balked. Um, yeah. Did you see that thing? It's a medium-sized mouse at best, and it's probably just as terrified of you. It's a rat, and it's evil. It's a mouse and it probably wandered in when someone held the door open for too long. It happens, not a big deal. Shall I walk you in? I don't think I can do that, Sam said. So you plan to live out here? Samantha considered this. What if you got rid of it? I don't mind the mouse, but I'd rather not handle it personally, if at all possible. I do have standards. Sly will deal with it when he gets back. I guess I'll just have to wait then. Hunter shook her head in what seemed to be mild annoyance, and without another word, lifted Samantha into her arms and carried her through the lobby. You're kind of being a baby about this. You get that, right? 
but Samantha was lost in the fact that Hunter's arms were around her, and she was able to inhale what seemed to be the aroma of fresh cotton and peaches. Would it be wrong of her to bury her face in Hunter's neck? Because really, that was all she wanted to do. Absently, she realized Hunter had said something. Hmm? They stepped onto the elevator and Hunter met her eyes. The smaller space seemed more intimate. And with their faces only an inch or two apart, Hunter lowered her voice. I said, you're being a little bit of a baby. That mouse is probably hurt that you ran from him. He just wanted to get to know you better. His heart is broken. A mousy ache. A mousy ache, Sam said back, not fully taking in the conversation. She shook her head, refocusing. That's a thing? It is now. Hunter had the longest eyelashes and the softest brown eyes. So big and expressive. It wasn't fair how easy it was to lose yourself in eyes like those. It occurred to her then that there had been a terrifying mouse incident just minutes before. Seemed a distant memory now. Hunter was still holding her in the elevator, she realized. And though she'd miss the contact very much, she should probably cut her a break. After she took just a moment to savor the feeling, that is because it really was everything. You can put me down now, Sam said. Thank you for your help. Hunter held her gaze as the car ascended slowly. Her facial expression was resolute. Not yet, she said quietly. Samantha's eyes found the panel of buttons on the wall. And that was when she realized that they weren't on their way to the office. Hunter had pushed the button for the eleventh floor, their apartment. Her stomach flip-flopped at the probable implication. Her mouth went dry at the thought. She licked her lips, a nervous gesture, and turned back to Hunter, intent on pointing out the less-than-wise detour. But Hunter's mouth was on hers before she could react. And it turned out that was totally okay because Hunter kissed like heaven on earth. Samantha was shocked at the strength of that kiss, how fast her body responded, convincing her easily that the eleventh floor was maybe the best idea ever. Her body now pulsed with a kind of electricity she never knew it could possess. It drove her crazy, so to compensate, she pushed her tongue into Hunter's mouth, exploring, tasting, savoring. God, it felt so right to finally give in to what had preoccupied her for days. To just say, to hell with it and follow her primal instincts. And God, was this instinct worth the wait? The elevator dinged and Hunter didn't hesitate. She carried Samantha into the apartment and deposited her quickly on the counter. Her eyes were focused, determined. She was on a mission as she pulled the black v-neck over her head revealing a purple satin bra beneath. Sam stared in awe at the picturesque visual, the generous tops of breasts peeking out from the fabric. Hunter stepped out of her pants and stood succulently before Sam in matching lingerie. Without pause, she found Sam's mouth once again and kissed her with an abandon that was quite simply contagious. Samantha's hands pushed against that bra her thumbs circling her nipples through the thin material. It was the hottest thing Samantha had ever experienced, this unexpected twist in her day. They'd been hard at work at the office just an hour before, and now look at them. She didn't do things like this. This so wasn't part of the routine. Hunter's hands were on the move, unbuttoning Sam's shirt, her hands instantly inside it. Sam arched into the touch, pushing her breasts into Hunter's eager hands and closing her eyes at the sensation. She didn't have matching lingerie. Would that be a problem? Unimportant details, she thought, as she pulled Hunter's bottom lip into her mouth in a move that had Hunter responding with a quiet moan. She smiled into the kiss. It turned out she was actually good at this. 
Sam's shirt was off, her bra too. And she was on the kitchen counter. The kitchen counter, people, come on. Hunter pulled back and stared at Sam, her chest rising and falling with labored breath. Watching Hunter try to maintain control when she was normally so confident was more than a turn on. Because she had done that. She had affected Hunter that way. It was an empowering feeling, and Sam loved it. Placing her hands on either side of Hunter's face, she brought her back down for a searing kiss that simply put, rocked her socks off. I want you, Hunter whispered against her mouth. Now. But for Sam, wanting was off the table. This was more. This was need. She nodded, meeting Hunter's darkened eyes. And that seemed to be all Hunter required as she lifted Sam from where she sat on the counter and carried her back to Hunter's bedroom. Hunter was on top, and Sam reveled against the feel of Hunter's weight lightly pressing her into the mattress, her warm skin flush against Sam's. They kissed in a hot tangle of lips and tongues until Samantha thought she might explode. But there was something she had to have first. She reversed their positions and smiled at Hunter's surprised expression. But Samantha was on a mission and could not be deterred. It was unlike her to take such control in the bedroom, but she was finding it liberating, like a drug. Removing the last of Hunter's clothing was fun, but discovering what lay beneath the fabric was the real reward. She studied the now naked body beneath her. Curious about all the ways to make Hunter feel, something she desperately needed to do. She skimmed a hand from Hunter's neck down her breast to her stomach, encouraged as Hunter sucked in a breath. She took her time, kissing, touching, and experimenting. She made careful note of what Hunter responded to. Her neck was sensitive, her breasts even more so. She wondered about the insides of her thighs and moved lower. Hunter was feeling a lot of things. Number one was that she couldn't take much more of this languid exploration Sam seemed intent on. She was vibrating with desire and squirming beneath Sam's touch in an attempt at any kind of release. Samantha placed a slow kiss on the inside of her thigh that had her closing her eyes and surrender. Sam, she managed to whisper. In fact, it was all she could manage. In answer, Samantha raised her head and moved upward for a kiss. It was slow, deep, and thorough. She brought her knee between Hunter's legs and applied direct pressure, wringing a gasp from Hunter as the kiss became rough and demanding. I've got you. Samantha said as she moved steadily down her body. She parted Hunter's thighs gently, her breath a soft caress. With the flat of her tongue, Sam licked the most tender part of Hunter, who was instantly hit with a jolt of something powerful. She squeezed the sheets in her hand, nodding them furiously. God, Sam, please. As Sam continued, Hunter turned her head against the pillow. It was too much, the onslaught of torturous sensation, way too much. She was gone. Sam held her in place, moving her tongue in tantalizing circles as Hunter's body continued to climb, the pressure almost unbearable. She moved her hips helplessly against Sam's mouth, giving herself over fully. And then at one final swipe of Sam's tongue, she called out and arched against Sam's mouth. The pleasure came over her all at once, a tidal wave of sensation she was helpless beneath. She shuddered and held on because it was all she could do. It was amazing, the release. Heaven. Hunter lost her bearings for a moment, unsure of where she was, who she was. But when they returned, Samantha was placing soft kisses to the underside of her breast and then peeking up at her with those perfect green eyes. You're beautiful, Samantha said quietly, shaking her head. She traced the curve of Hunter's cheek, 
The gesture caused Hunter's voice to catch in her throat when she attempted to answer. So instead, she smiled to let Sam know that she'd heard her, that it meant something. Cradling Sam's face, she placed a soft kiss on her lips and slid a hand between her legs. She closed her eyes against what she found there and stroked steadily, lost in how amazing Sam felt, how wet and ready she already was. Back and forth across her center, slow and even. Samantha's lips parted in response to being touched. She closed her eyes in rapture as Hunter continued the movement. Back and forth, teasing just enough. When Sam whimpered softly, she slipped inside into warmth and wonder, all the while moving her thumb more purposefully now, across that most sensitive spot. Samantha held on and moved against her in a sexy rhythm, her breath becoming more and more shallow with each second that ticked by. Hunter slid down the bed and pulled a nipple into her mouth, her fingers and lips working in tandem. Samantha squeezed her wrist in urgency, but Hunter couldn't be rushed. Not yet, she murmured. Hunter continued to massage and tease until even she couldn't stand it anymore. Knowing it wouldn't take much, she applied very firm pressure where she knew Samantha needed it most, and held on as Sam clenched around her, moving wildly against her before reveling in the pause of relief. But the shocking part was that Hunter was right behind her. Again, which never happened. The unexpected orgasm shot through her as she pressed against Sam. She saw white as the blissful explosion rocked her body. She shook her head as she leveled out again. They were a force, she realized. The two of them, together like this. Silence lingered as their breathing returned to normal. Once Hunter had recovered, she looked down at Sam. Okay, she asked. Sam took a deep breath and nodded. Still recovering but there was a soft smile on display that helped to assure her. Hunter wrapped Sam up in her arms from behind and placed a kiss on her shoulder blade. We just did that a second time, Sam said. I don't think we had a choice. There's this thing between us, and it seemed to take up all the air in the room. And then there's the fact that we're really, really good at it. Right, Hunter said. Who knew? All this time. Samantha turned over so they were lying face to face. She traced the outline of Hunter's breast with one finger. It's kinda nice having this option. Especially since I just feel, I don't know, so comfortable with you. Safe. Hunter liked hearing that. You feel safe with me? I do. Like I can just be me. I feel the same way. It felt good, talking to Samantha like this. Candidly. Sam turned onto her back. We're totally going to hell now, if we weren't before. And while I know this was theoretically a bad idea, it actually doesn't feel that way right now. A mirage? A guilty pleasure, Hunter corrected. Well, there was a lot of pleasure, Sam said, looking skyward, all dreamy and cute. Then a thought seemed to occur to her. We're supposed to be at work right now, remember? The words spoke of obligation, but the mischievous look on Samantha's face overruled it. Unable to stop herself, Hunter moved in and nibbled on Sam's neck but playing hooky is fun. And you happen to be really sexy right now. There seems to be no way to get enough of you. It's a problem. You've said that before. Sam wrapped her arms around Hunter's neck to better receive the attention. You really think I'm sexy? It's my number one thought in life right now. We never had lunch, you know. Hunter pulled back. No? Nope. I left our sandwiches to the rodent in the lobby, remember? 
Sly is probably not our biggest fan right now, as a result. Hunter found she didn't really care. He'll live. What do you want to eat? Samantha grinned. I'll get it. But she didn't take the sheet with her when she got up. And she didn't even shrug into a t-shirt from Hunter's dresser. No. The woman who drove her wild walked, nude and confident, into the kitchen, as Hunter looked on smiling. When she returned, she carried with her a package of olives, a box of crackers, and a bag of tiny marshmallows. Hunter studied the array. And you somehow feel this is lunch. Samantha slid into bed next to her with her finds. I always have weird cravings after sex. Can't help it. A fridge raid is a necessity. As Hunter regarded her, Samantha's eyes widened. What? Stop staring at me in judgment. She shrugged. Everyone has something. It was a strange quirk, but at the same time kind of endearing. No judgment here. Pass me a marshmallow, weirdo. That earned her a marshmallow in the face. They ate their eclectic lunch leisurely in bed, enjoying each other's company in a way that felt so natural, it was shocking. Hunter stared at Samantha as a slow flutter moved through her, because this felt different from any other sexual experience she'd had. She could lie here with Sam for hours. In fact, she wanted to. Maybe it was a testament to their friendship, but for Hunter, it was beginning to feel like maybe it really was more. She hadn't been wrong about the direction of her feelings the other night at Showplace. It was terrifying, but at the same time, kind of exciting. We really should get back to the office, Sam said. We will. Hunter played absently with Sam's hair. God, she was feeling a lot of things. And maybe she should just say them, be up front with Samantha, and maybe even herself. Was it possible she was interested in something more with Sam? Was that absolutely insane? Because it felt like it might be. There was a lot on the line. Savvy, their friendship. But, and this was the big question, what if Samantha was feeling a little of what Hunter was? Sam started to gather her clothes. As she buttoned her shirt, she turned to Hunter. Will I see you downstairs? Yes. A pause. She was vibrating with nervous energy at what she was about to say. She'd really never put herself out there to someone before. Where did one start? Do you think maybe we should talk about it? Us? She could feel her heart beating out of her chest, and she blinked in anticipation. Sam looked caught. She opened her mouth and then closed it, her expression clouded as if she didn't know quite where to go with the question. Finally, she shrugged, relaxing into a smile. What's to talk about? It's just sex. And there you have it. Right, Hunter said. But then Sam's smile faltered. You said so yourself a week ago. Hunter nodded, solemn, resolute. Clearly she was on her own here. No strings, that's the deal. Still is. They stared at each other, and the silence was no longer the comfortable kind. Sam turned to go. See you at work. And then, as if forgetting something, popped back around the corner. You're the best. You know that, right? Hunter smiled. Push. You say that to all the girls. Laughing was easier than the alternative. Please, you're the one with groupies. She shrugged. That's me. But even with Samantha smiling at her, teasing her, she was beginning to understand that what she really wanted was outside her reach. Alone in her room, she lay back and studied the patterns on the ceiling as one emotion after another took its turn with her. She looked over at the empty spot in the bed next to her. 
the one that mirrored the emptiness in her life. An emptiness she'd been quite comfortable with, until now. She'd never wanted to give herself over to someone that way. And now she knew why. Because the last thing she wanted was to feel all this. Chapter 12 Samantha had to hand it to balmy days. When the staff at the retirement community decorated, they decorated. Uncle Sam hats hung from the ceiling en masse. Red, white, and blue streamers crisscrossed the common room in a twisting, twirling parade of crepe paper overkill. Miniature American flags lined the wall. And if Samantha wasn't mistaken, there seemed to be an instrumental mashup of Yankee Doodle Dandy and Your Grand Old Flag piped in on the PA system. The holiday weekend was still a few days away and while she and her friends had plans to spend it in the Hamptons at a summer home owned by Mallory's family, they still had the rest of the week to get through. Sam wasn't about to check out early and miss scrapbooking class at the senior center. She even managed to wrangle the other savvy girls into joining, per her class's request. Where do you want me, chief? Brooklyn asked, arriving ten minutes late and smiling warmly to make up for it. Mr. Turner has trouble with the scrapbooking scissors. See if he'll let you do some of his cutting for him. Then she lowered her voice. He's a little grumpy, so don't take it personally. Grumpy old guy? Say no more. We're going to be best friends. Brooklyn whispered back before heading off in search of her charge. Samantha surveyed the activity around her. Mallory had organized the women into a sort of circle and moved between them offering tips. I find that if you lay out your page before pasting anything down, then you have the chance to make changes to the overall design. Planning is important. Yes, dear. But what conditioner do you use? Mrs. Swinetech asked. Your hair is extra shiny. Mallory smiled at the diversion. I believe it's called Purology. I'm going to tell the nurse's aide to order me some. It won't get you Harold's attention, Mrs. Gauducci muttered to her page. Guess we'll find out, Mrs. Swinetech fired back. Mallory raised her eyebrows at Sam, who smiled and placed a reassuring hand on her back as she passed. You're doing great, Mal. Keep tossing that shiny, shiny hair. Across the room, as one could have imagined, Mr. Glenville hung on Hunter's every word. Which was good, because when it came to scrapbooking, the girl knew what she was doing. She had great ideas for complementary color schemes and shape arrangement. The pages coming together on that side of the room were next level. Maybe you should be teaching the class, she said casually to Hunter who had just finished explaining color theory to Mr. Glenville and Mr. Earnhardt, who were actually taking notes. She wore dark denim overalls with a sleeveless white shirt underneath. The half ponytail capped off her casual summer vibe. It was a really good look on her, and Samantha had more than noticed. Was it weird that she thought about Hunter that way? It seemed almost second nature not something she could undo. A consequence of their arrangement, she guessed. We would never want to replace you, Sam, Mr. Glenville reassured her. But maybe your nice friend could assist and come with you each week. He put his arm around Hunter, who met Sam's eyes, shrugged, and smiled widely. Well, I have a lot on my plate she told Mr. Glenville, patting his hand. But I'll be by every once in a while, if it's okay with Samantha. And it is, Sam chimed in. You're always welcome to help out. Lend your particular skill set. She winked at Hunter, who glared back playfully. So, do you have a Facebook account? She heard Mr. Glenville say as she drifted away. Perfect.
Next, she moved on to Brooklyn, and gruff Mr. Turner, who seemed to be engaged in some sort of heated debate. Not good at all. Seeing Samantha approach, Mr. Turner raised his hand and pointed at Brooklyn. This blonde girl thinks I need to put more photos on each page. I think she needs to mind her own damn business. Similarly, Brooklyn raised her hand. I think Mr. Turner needs to suck it up and listen to my advice because one lonely photo in the center of a page is boring. There are lots of layouts to play with here, and he should explore them. Just my creative input. She crossed her arms and sat back in her chair. Samantha shot Brooklyn a what-the-hell look. But fine, she could solve this. Mr. Turner, maybe you'd like to work with Hunter, and Brooklyn can help Mallory with the group she's- No, 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 Mr. Turner said in annoyance. We're doing fine here. She's just spirited is all. I'm spirited too. Yeah, leave us be, Sammy, Brooklyn said, smiling proudly. We're the spirited table. Clearly. Understanding their unique camaraderie, Samantha smiled. Then I'll let you two work. It was turning into a great session. The residents had a palpable energy about them when new people came to visit. It warmed her heart to see them so reinvigorated, and she was grateful to her friends for doing her this favor. As they filed out at the end of the allotted class time, Brooklyn and Mallory went about helping Samantha with the cleanup. She gathered the glue sticks from the various tables and returned them to the large plastic bag, all the while keeping one eye on the front of the room. Hunter still sat quietly with Mr. Earnhardt as he took her through each page of his scrapbook and explained the significance of each memory he had shared with his late wife. Samantha looked on struck by the way Hunter took the time to quietly ask him questions and compliment the work he'd put into each page. It was a heartwarming exchange. She's good with him, Mallory whispered to Sam. Brooklyn nodded. Hunter's a softie. Most people miss that about her. Samantha's heart clenched in her chest. The scrapbook was important to Mr. Earnhardt, and Hunter understood that she cared. The class was over, and she surely had other places to be, but it was clear she was in no rush to clear out. This man had her undivided attention. What you don't realize, Mr. Earnhardt imparted to Hunter, is that life is not as long as you once thought it would be. Time flies by, and you have to devote these minutes to the precious cargo in your life. The precious cargo, Hunter said. There was something about Mr. Earnhardt and his approach to things that resonated with her. He was kind, yes, but it was more than that. He just seemed to get things, at least in retrospect, and she could learn something from the stories of his life. Wise and gentle, that was the best way to describe him and Hunter took his words to heart. You know, when you thought about it, he was right. It seemed like just yesterday she was starting her freshman year at NYU, and here she was all these years later, closing in on 30. Where had all the time gone? Outside of her career, what did she really have to show for it? What roots had she put down? Do you have any regrets? She asked him as he closed the scrapbook. Oh, quite a few, he said without preamble. But the biggest would be not marrying my Martha sooner. Then we would have had more time together. Hunter nodded. And why didn't you? Oh, I was stubborn and young. Kind of a horse's ass when it came to serious matters of the heart. Martha was right there in front of me the whole time. Just took my sweet time noticing. Hunter smiled. Thank you for sharing your stories with me. 
He smiled then, his eyes crinkling at the sides. I probably bored your socks off. Well, I'm not wearing socks, so we're good there. Mr. Earnhardt laughed. You're a pretty girl. Do you have a fella you go around with? I do not. No fellas for me. He took a minute, and then, oh, like Samantha, she used to have a girlfriend. She smiled. Yes, like that. Mr. Earnhardt raised his eyebrows and tossed a glance Sam's way. Are you two? No, sir. We're just friends. He nodded and stood, pushing slowly off the